And then, yeah, let's do, before we do Chris Talia, let's do Turkey Tom. Have you guys seen this? I haven't seen it all, but Turkey Tom, one of my favorite um, YouTube um, com commentators online now, YouTube content, com is it, com is it it's a con what they call it? It's a commentary content, brother. You know, people that do those type of things, right? Like the fucking, um, what's his face? Like the most critical guys and stuff, but I'm a big fan of Turkey Tom. I like him a lot. Um, and he's got another channel too called Tom Tom. He does other things on as well. So he did a video recently called the most hated comedians in the of all time it's on his channel called turkey tom as you can see there so i'm gonna quickly play this for you to see wagwan i believe the saying goes a jack of all trades is a master of none but oftentimes better than a master of one in the case of brendan schaub however some have cast doubt on this adage born and raised in colorado brendan's family had a history in competitive sports with his father being a second degree black belt in taekwondo and his uncle pax beal being a bodybuilder and ex-football player there's no coincidence since genetics definitely played a role in the proclivity towards athleticism Schaub grew to be well over six feet tall and unsurprisingly quickly found success in pursuits such as football and lacrosse while in high school, lettering twice in the former and four times in the latter, even being voted MVP in his senior year. Willie didn't attract the attention of any talent scouts when he tried out for the football and lacrosse teams of Whittier College, he got accepted into both. Though he was majoring in sociology, it was just a placeholder degree while he focused on his prospects as a full-time football player. Once he was done with college, he ultimately never got drafted or signed, causing him to retire in 07. However, this didn't mean he'd given up on being an athlete, far from it. After abandoning football, he picked up martial arts, in particular boxing and Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Much like his previous forays into sports, he quickly got somewhere with it, winning the novice division heavyweight title in Colorado and becoming the training partner of Shane Carwin, a heavyweight contender in the UFC. With this connection, he transitioned seamlessly into being an MMA fighter. Once again, he started out extremely well, with four wins in a row, all in the first round. It was only after three exhibition matches in The Ultimate Fighter, which he won, that he experienced his first loss, followed by another four victories in a row, one of them against Mirko Crow Cop, one of the most respected fighters in the UFC, though already 36 years old by that point. Not only did Schaub win, but his win was ruled the knockout of the night. After this, however, his fighting career gradually slowed down until it halted completely in 2014 after his loss to Travis Brown by TKO. Initially, he planned to continue fighting indefinitely, but after his loss, Joe Rogan and Brian Callen essentially did an intervention live on a podcast to convince him to retire from MMA. While their conversation was long. What do you guys think about this still? Looking back at it, looking back at it, I think this is actually what friends are meant to do. I don't think it was mean. I think this is when they actually were all friends. When they actually were all friends, they'd say things to each other that maybe they probably don't like to hear. But when it's coming from a friend, it should be better than hearing it from strangers. Like this is how your friends really should be. Your friends should be able to kind of call you out on your shit and they should be able to maybe be brutally honest with you. Usually, I feel like. But again, over time, with more money and influence and you just lack of care. I think when you get just a certain level of money, you just stop caring about everything. Maybe everybody around you don't really give a fuck what they do, really. Just do what you do to keep out of my way. But I, I think this was probably a sign of when they were last really friends. When they could speak openly to each other about certain things, you know? Like in that respect. So I don't I don't really see this as mean or as bullying. I see this, this is actually a good thing that he done at the time because essentially it kind of led to Brendan becoming as successful as he is now, right? He basically helped Brendan become a multimillionaire by telling him, hey, you suck at fighting, stop right now. Not a bad thing really, but I think some people look back on it now and think, you know what? It was done, it was bad taste, it should have done it on air. I don't have an issue with it personally. I, I think it was perf perfectly fine. A slightly edited version uploaded to YouTube netted over 5 million views. People were mostly taken aback by how brutally honest Joe was to Brendan. While Brendan took his UFC losses in perhaps more stride than he should have, no knockout was as devastating as having his two best friends walk him down conversationally and strip him of his ego in regard to the reality of the situation. In the bluntest terms possible, while still being sympathetic to him, Joe explained that Shab was simply in way over his head when it came to fighting, and if he kept putting himself in the cage with elite fighters, he would continue to get knocked out and hurt until he suffered irreversible brain damage. Ultimately, it seems that Shab recognized that Joe was right and that being a professional fighter was far too big a risk for a guy like him, who certainly had other ways of making money besides getting his head- Oh really? Is that true? Matt Guerra says, fun fact, this combo was on TFAT K podcast episode. Oh yeah, true. You're right. They did. They recorded this show in Joe Rogan's podcast episode studio, but it was actually a Fire in the Kid episode, the same way that how Rogan will let sometimes Lex Friedman, Tim Dillon, 
and Theo Vaughn do the same thing. Oh, yeah. So this is the first and only time Rogan's ever been on the fight to fight on a kid. And they've got like, what? Over 600 episodes, maybe more than that. And he's only been on that show once. And I think he's been on Theo's show at least twice, no? He's, I think he's been on Tim Dillon's show at least twice. He's, he, yeah, he's been on each of those guys' shows at least more than once. That's fucking crazy, man. That, to me, would be something I would find a little bit... I take personally. I'm not going to lie. I take that a little bit personal. Like, why aren't you coming on my show? Why are you our friends, but you don't want to go that... F like, you know what I mean? I'd be a little bit annoyed. Head kicked in by people who are more proficient than him at MMA. Despite it obviously not being ideal that a conversation as sensitive as this was taking place in front of millions of people, both parties showed the kind of respect and grace that is becoming increasingly hard to come by these days. Eventually, years later, the two revisited the intervention, and when asked about why he brought it up in the middle of a podcast, Joe said that he wasn't planning to do it, but once the topic came up, he got genuinely emotional and did it out of a deep sense of concern for Shab. Due to the nature of the situation, there was no way for Brendan to come out looking good. If he had gotten angry, he would have just been seen as delusional. But because he ended up agreeing with Joe, it just fanned the flames of a perception people already had of him, which was that he was Joe's yes man and went along with anything he said. Then again, people often say that Joe is the yes man that changes his opinions based on the guests, so at this point, this didn't get Shab too much hate. If you exclusively take into account his career in fighting and his participation in podcasts, the most Shab could be considered is annoying or not the best communicator. However, things changed drastically when he made a hard pivot to be being a comedian. For starters, this move was considered poorly thought out since Brendan spent the majority of his life being an athlete in some capacity and had absolutely no experience or seemingly prior interest in being a comic. People were confused as to why he didn't become a coach or open up a gym, especially considering that Eddie Bravo, another frequent JRE guest, took that route with significant success. A year prior to his departure from the Octagon, Schaub had begun a podcast with fellow Joe Rogan collaborator Brian Callen called The Fighter and the Kid. Eventually, either because the podcast podcast was good enough, or because Shab and Callan were sufficiently connected, the podcast was picked up by Fox. Most likely, it's a combination of the two, since at the time, plenty of episodes were getting hundreds of thousands to even millions of views on YouTube. Many episodes featured comedians and other more established personalities, which certainly helped it become popular. In retrospect, the way Brendan came off in the show was much less obnoxious than what he'd become infamous for. Exactly. Not only could you sympathize with him, but you could also occasionally laugh at his exchanges with Brian. This was very impressive, since this was someone who wasn't media trained, with no experience in the field he was getting into i think turkey tom makes a good point maybe the actual point when brendan actually started to become incredibly unlikable was when he went into stand-up comedy because before that when he was just a lovable jock type of dude a podcast personality people didn't mind him i didn't mind him but for some reason when he got into stand-up comedy and he started to actually believe that he deserved to have the success that he had, even though he didn't really work hard for it and most of it was coming through his fucking podcast success and he didn't have any level of humility about it. He came into it. And I think the part of it is what I remember rubbing up people the wrong way. There was a part where I think you remember early on, he kept like heart, like jokingly bullying Brian because Brian wasn't selling tickets that time. And he was selling loads. He was selling out places because he just started, maybe because of part of the intrigue. I don't know. But there was a period in time where at the beginning of Bre Brennan Shaw's stand-up career, he was selling out shows. And I remember there'll be particular podcasts where at the end, when they do their little plugs for their dates, Brendan would be like, oh, all the, all the dates are sold out. I've got nothing really to promote. So just go to the website and kind of like brag and kind of look at Bre Brian and like in a jokey way, like go on, you, you tell me your dates now. Tell the audience your dates. You kind of would brag and stunt about it and the assumption or the, the kind of the thing that he was trying to say but not say was that, oh, he had kind of like an athlete's mindset when he came into stand-up comedy. He was able to work way harder at it than other people. He was able to put in the hours. And that's why he's kind of been more successful than other comedians because they're more, they're kind of lazy or they indulge themselves in booze and going out more. He just treats it as a job. He clocks in and clocks out. And I think, remember, he used to say a lot, he treated comedy like going in the gym. It's like sets and reps, sets and reps. There was never a, you know, never any talk about being funny. It was always a point of like just getting the sets in, sets and reps, sets and reps. And that's why he became so successful. So I think Turkey Tones made a good point. Maybe Brendan's pivot of being unlikable was when he went into stand-up comedy because that's when he started to think his shit didn't stink. And with a speech impediment, who was somehow doing well for himself in a medium that consisted entirely of being good at communicating. Actually, no, what was he saying? Uh, 
Hell yeah, I go big up you. I remember being on your streams when there were 10 viewers. You're coming up, my dude. Yeah, big up. You know the vibes. You know the vibes. To be fair, this stream isn't very indicative of how my normal streams go. When I do my main show, my Exynos Zinger Show podcast, the numbers aren't as good. Let me not let me not lie. I'm not going to try and use this as some sort of like, you know, marker of how my appeal is overall. This is a very particular niche group of people that like to hear this type of stuff. But big up you for the nice words. Uh, Obi was saying here, uh, Tashki is saying, once he accumulated that level of delusion that allowed him to pursue comedy at a high level, he became insufferable. You know what? I'm going to actually push back on that. I don't think it's delusional to try and pursue a career in stand-up comedy. That's not the delusional part of it. The delusional part of it is him not understanding like what level he's at. Because when Brendan came into it, remember, Brendan came into stand-up comedy and refused to do open mics. He refused to do stuff of his level. He refused to do like random fucking, go up and do random sets at random clubs. You know, people always say this a lot about comedians where they'd go to a random city and they would just pop in and do a quick set. I don't know what the term is, but there's a thing that comedians always do to try and basically get reps and to kind of practice their material. Brendan refused to do that. All the shows that Brendan did were always shows that he would kind of do as a tour or whatever it may be, or in big clubs. He never, ever accepted the level he was at. He always assumed because of his fame and because of how crazy he was to Joe, that he could skip certain steps. That's a delusion. And then the thing about Brendan that's really odd, he skipped the steps and he thought it wouldn't harm his ability to tell jokes. When in actuality, those early skips maybe have hurt him because a part of me thinks, unpopular opinion, a part of me thinks Brendan isn't as unfunny as some people think he is. I think a lot of stand-up comedians are unfunny. I don't think he's an exception. I think in general, in stand-up, there's way more <clears throat> unfunny people out there making a career than actually that are funny. So I think Brendan's just one of many. But the issue with Brendan is that he actually thinks he's fucking funny. You know what I mean? Like, it's not like he actually, he actually believes he's fucking hilarious and he doesn't understand how maybe the things that he did in the beginning of his career has maybe hurt him overall because he's an ability to kind of play that level a bit because all it would have taken him is just a little bit of humility do a few open mics not take the fucking um showtime money early on and just kind of play the long game and maybe he would have been in a better place. Who knows? Cation. He must have been doing something right. At least that's what people thought at the time. The problem was Brendan's relative success in this area started getting to his head very fast. While he's never been the most charismatic guy, earlier on he was likable, as the podcast relied exactly. mostly on the chemistry exactly. between him and Callan, whose conversations often sounded like two friends talking. But as the show grew, so did Brendan Schaub's ego, to astronomical proportions. Brendan is notorious for being someone who's easily suggestible, and in an interview he and Brian gave to the Dallas Observer, he reveals that Brian was the one that told him to start doing stand-up. He says, We're having success with a podcast, and Brian said, Hey man, we should do the show on the road and do a live show. I thought that sounded terrible. But his idea was not to take the podcast on the road, but to do a live comedy performance. He wanted me to open up and do stand-up. I said, That's not my wheelhouse. I know my limitations. But he said I was looking at it wrong. He wanted me to start off by telling a story, and we added from there. For a guy who's competed his entire life in athletics, competed at the highest level in football and fighting, fought in front of 60,000 people and millions of people on pay-per-view nothing beats these live shows can you imagine if and i think that's what they should have stuck with actually they should have continued doing those t fat k live shows as opposed to doing their individual fucking stand-up comedy shows personally i feel like they would be way more successful doing that type of thing than brendan trying to pursue a career or he's trying to be fucking louis ck that's never gonna work out really because he just hasn't got it um the brutal reality of it is you know he's always been an athlete his entire life he was never a joker Never Mr. Funny Guy, never the class clown, never. So to suddenly start a career being a stand-up comedian in your mid-30s, even if you have got a funny bone in your body, it's going to be very difficult. It's just hard to do. And if you are going to do it, you have to do it in a very methodical type of way where you maybe, you know, try to really try to, you know, get down to the bare bones and break down the fucking science of fucking being funny. And just get up there and be a fucking robot and just deliver lines after lines after lines after lines and try and be funny that way. But he didn't even do that. So the reality of it is that he's he was never ever going to be funny, probably. It was a very short, you know, he didn't really have a chance for it, but his approach didn't help him. That's the real main issue about it. His approach didn't help him.
If Brendan listened to his gut instinct here and didn't get into stand-up. Within a year of this terrible lapse in judgment, Brendan had evidently developed illusions of grandeur about his talent as a communicator and performer. Instead of crediting the somewhat sudden success of the podcast and their subsequent live shows to the setup being good and the guests being interesting, he thought he was the reason they were working. In 2016, he started doing some stand-up shows as a solo act and started his own podcast, Big Brown Breakdown, a name he wisely changed to The Shab Show. His podcast was well-received, at least initially, because for once, he was talking about something he at least had some experience with, fighting. Over time, however, the show's ratings took a downturn as listeners noticed that the show was gradually moving away from being about fighting and towards being about Shab. One of the reviews on iTunes puts it pretty succinctly. I used to love this show. Shab is trying to be a Hollywood star or something and has changed a lot over the years. Dude, we don't care about name dropping or anything celebrity-like. We listen to your show because you are funny and down to earth. Get back to basics. It's actually pretty tragic to look at how rave the reviews for the Shab show used to be, and how much this unchecked ego destroyed his reputation with people who genuinely liked him. This issue wasn't exclusive to his podcast, Actually, but destroyed his reputation, let, let raving the, the reviews for the oh, that. Earth. Get oh. back to basics. It's actually pretty tragic to- One of them here. Have to update my review. Podcast isn't what it used to be. He used to be actually- uh, talk, Actually talk about fighting. Now he talks about himself in the most unlikable ways. Huge fan, but- um, items that need to be addressed 45 minute intro on the weekend activities which is fine then you repeat them on tfat k uh that's very true to look at how raving the reviews for the shop show used to be and how much this unchecked shop has really fallen off um i used to be a huge fan of everything shop did but along the way his head has gotten so big he has let hit a number of different annoying characters blah blah, blah. Um, and you know what's really funny about this review that's actually the main crux of the issue of Brendan because I don't feel like I don't feel like most people care about Brendan and other people like that. I feel like most people that do care who make this type of content that I'm doing whatever usually start off being fans. So it's actually a real bad indictment on how terrible of a person you are over time that you turn your fans into quote unquote detractors. That's the actual real hard reality of it. Because he's not famous enough to attract a whole legion of haters or just following him just for the sake of just not liking you. No, usually people start off liking you, then they don't like you because of something that you do and you're unable to kind of correct course. That's actually quite disturbing. Um, another one, 15 minutes of fight talk, 15 minutes of ads and the rest of the show is awkward transitions. Get the ads or the fight talk. If you love ads and a combat sports sport, this is <laughs> Jesus Christ. Fact, ego destroyed his reputation with people who genuinely liked him. This issue wasn't exclusive to his podcast. Much to the contrary, it polluted every facet of his public life. In The Fighter and the Kid, his tendency to recklessly interrupt guests and even his co-host Brian became increasingly prominent. As early as the show's departure from its affiliation with Fox in 2016, people were picking up on their deteriorating relationship. As Shaw would often ridicule Brian's opinions and frequently cut him off. Yes, Despite the fact that, even though we didn't have any of Brennan's hands-on experience with mixed martial arts, Brian frankly sounded more knowledgeable on it. Overall, Brennan just seemed like he was no longer trying to be likable whatsoever. In another venture of his, the Below the Belt series, which is simultaneously titled Food Truck Diaries and Fight Talk, because Brennan can't seem to settle on- Oh, okay. So below the- hold on. I thought Big Brown Breakdown went into being Below the Belt didn't Big Brown Breakdown get signed to Sh Showtime? Then when he got fired from Showtime, he changed the name to The Shub Show, right? If I'm not mistaken. So Below the Belt doesn't exist. Below the Belt is now um, Morning Combat. That's what it is now on YouTube, right? If, if I'm not mistaken. Fucking you no. Know, how many names? How many shows has this guy had? How many fucking chances? How many deals? Always fucking pissing up the wall. Fucking no. hell. And the other funny thing about it is that I've always said that Showtime check... He really messed up that way, man. He shouldn't have, he shouldn't have, that show should have been his best show, really. The MMA show should have been the best one. The name if his life depended on it. Brennan would frequently screw up the names of the fighters he was talking about. This was jarring since part of the appeal of the show, which was greenlit by the TV network Showtime, was having someone with a background in the UFC talk about fighting. But throughout the entire thing, he consistently sounds like he has no idea what he's talking about. Regardless, because of the sheer caliber of the people Shab managed to get on the show, many of the episodes were very successful on YouTube. As people had come to expect at this point, every time Brennan was successful with an endeavor, it just magnified all of his character flaws. 
was. Another of his behavior patterns that had become noticeable was his tendency to brag about his lifestyle and accomplishments, often resorting to exaggerating and lying about them to make himself look good. While he had already been doing this for a long time, initially, no one had any reason to suspect it. But as the public's opinion of him grew negative, people started to scrutinize his claims, only to find out he was basically a pathological liar. One of the best examples of this is his This Is Not Happening performance in 2019, where he goes over his career in the UFC. At the point this video came out, the fighter and the kid subreddit had already turned against Schaub and became exclusively dedicated to hate following and documenting his continuous downfall. Identifying as homeless cats and fry cooks at PF Chang's <laughs> after a bizarre rant from Schaub about why he didn't care about what his haters thought, the members of the subreddit were rigorous in not letting Brendan get away with anything. As a result, the details of his story about his career in the UFC were closely examined, and it turns out he lied through the whole thing. He claimed his- Wow, I forgot. Oh yeah, true. There's a whole entire fucking- um, post debunking everything that's happening that this is a, hey, this is not happening fucking story. Claim, hey, he says his childhood dream for 20 years was become a UFC champion. Truth. His childhood dream of 20 years to be in the NFL. Exactly. We all know this. There's a link to it too. Claim. He says Royce Gracie v. Ken Shamrock was the first ever fight in UFC 1. Truth. Their fight was sandwiched in tournament bracket. Wasn't the first or last fight of the night. Claim. 10th or 11th ranked Brendan um, was set to fight second ranked heavyweight Travis Brown. Travis was ranked third at the time and Brendan wasn't even in the top 15. <laughs> Fucking love it, man. The lies are incredible. Childhood dream was to be a mixed martial artist when in a podcast appearance, he claimed it was to play in the NFL. He played up both his and his opponent's rank in the UFC, as well as lying about how many people were in attendance to make his fight sound more important. He name drops multiple big celebrities saying they were at the fight, which literally none of them were. These are just a few of the lies in his individual video, because if you were to exhaustively go through the stuff he says in the podcast, he lies so often about topics so inane that it's impossible to document all of it. Sure, his this is not happening appearance is a stand-up comedy routine and comedians lie all the time to make their stories funnier but the issue here is the fictional parts don't contribute to the comedy they just contribute to Shab's inflated perception of himself exactly. and since we're on the topic of his comedy his arrogance is also the culprit for the utter annihilation of any respectable career in stand-up he could have potentially had instead of putting the work in for a decade or even longer to scrape together one hour of material worthy of turning into a special after just a measly couple of years calling himself a comedian he released you'd be surprised. It would go on to become the worst rated special of all time. Literally. It's a 1.5 out of 10 on IMDb. While the public was blissfully ignorant of just how incompetent a comic Brendan Schaub actually was until after the special came out, some of his friends saw this coming from a mile away. Joey Diaz, for example, despite holding out hope that Schaub would eventually develop into a legitimate comedian, instinctually didn't like Brendan Schaub's move into comedy for the exact reasons that were mentioned earlier. He compared it to the opposite situation. Situation. If a lifelong comic, who happened to win a couple of amateur fights, proceeded to call himself a professional fighter and put himself in the ring in front of thousands of people, it's only reasonable to expect that this person gets the beatdown of their life exactly. with a side of thorough humiliation. In a way, that's what Brendan got. What many people have pointed out was that it wasn't just a regular failure to launch. It was a sign that Brendan didn't care about being a good comedian in the first place. Honestly, that episode with Joey Diaz was one of the best because Joey, in like a nice way, was trying to tell Brendan what he shouldn't do by telling him how he didn't like how he got into stand-up comedy. He was trying to tell him in a nice way, right? He was trying to. But Brendan is so dense, he didn't clock on to what he was trying to say. He just took it as like, oh yeah, you know, what I could, I could tell you didn't like me at that time when I was doing stand-up. I could tell you were a bit off about it, but now I'm happy you've come around to it and you like it and you know that I'm good at it. That should have been like a little bit of a heads up of like, what's, what's Joey actually trying to say here? That's what he should have been thinking. What's he actually trying to say to me? He never thought about that once and just took it as this like a, a face value. Oh yeah, he's just saying this thing. I'm going to keep it moving. But Joey is actually trying to tell him something without being super explicit about it. But he just didn't clock it. All he wanted was a special with his name on it and he was willing to go to whatever lengths necessary to get something out and earn that validation. But when the special was released and the negative reactions began flooding in, he couldn't accept the fact that it was getting panned. After all, he was a self-professed renaissance man who could instantly excel at anything he tried. Instead of retreating and realizing that he had gotten way ahead of himself by releasing a special with just a few years of experience under his belt as a mature person would do, he decided to falsely copyright strike any YouTube video that dared to disturb 
disturb his debut as a professional comedian. If only someone had informed him of the Streisand effect before he made this dumb attempt at silencing his critics, he could have saved himself from the following years of continued criticism. One particular YouTuber by the name of Beige Frequency made a video called Brendan Schaub's You'd Be Surprised is the worst comedy special I've ever seen, which as you can imagine isn't exactly kind to Schaub's magnum opus. Within 24 hours, the video was taken down twice by Joe Rogan's media company, Bent Pixels, which Beige revealed in another upload. For a moment there, Brendan had the opportunity to play the part of a meathead with a bad first special, which would not only be redeemable, but if he handled it right, could be a great place to start out as an exactly. underdog. Exactly. I mean, Louis C.K. came back from being exposed for being a pervert with a leaked set that instantly became massive. But Brendan made the fatal mistake of adding insult to injury and letting everyone know that he wasn't willing to take the L. He wasn't just a bad comedian anymore, he was a bad person, and sooner or later, everyone would know about it. The thing about the internet is that events like this don't happen in a vacuum. Once things start moving in a certain direction, the tendency is to snowball, not slow down. I know looking up people's net worth online is a meme, but considering the type of gigs he gets and the lifestyle he lives, Brendan is most likely sitting on at least a mill or two. My point being, he absolutely does not need to be concerned about what YouTubers are saying about him. By engaging with them and stooping as low as false copyright striking people for being mean to him, he was inviting the attention of people to whom stooping low becomes second nature. That's a really good point. Like, without even addressing his fucking, you know, the errors of his ways, or maybe without even addressing some of the public backlash that he gets, if he just would have ignored everything and just pretended like it didn't exist and just focused on doing what he does, he would have been fine. That's the funny thing about it. He didn't even need to do any sort of like self inventory, any kind of looking into the mirror, any kind of analysis any kind of self-work, nothing. He could have just simply ignored everything and he would have been totally fine. But he chose not to and then end up kind of biting him in the bum, really. Because the takedowns were done manually, the people criticizing Schaub not only knew that he was looking himself up to see what everyone was saying about him, but he was really upset about it, too. Perhaps because of the steep decline in chemistry between him and Brian Callen, Brendan sensed that the fighter and the kid had his days of success counted and decided to start yet another podcast, this time with Chris D'Elia, Eric Griffin, and Theo Vaughn, which was initially called The King and the Sting, then The King and the Sting and Wing, and finally, The Golden Hour, because everything Shab does is contractually obliged to be. I think he got that one a bit wrong. I think King of the Sting was always a Theo Vaughn and him show because I think that started from the premise of when Theo first started coming on Fire and the Kid, he would always go back and forward with fucking insulting. Oh shit, boy, look, I just noticed there's a black guy in the back. Fuck, I didn't notice that first. There's a black guy in the back. <laughs> That's like me when I stream at night. Shit, I didn't see him. I swear to God, I didn't see him. I swear to God, I thought I was a poster or something. Fucking hell. That's like me when I stream at night. Honestly, I just realized I was a fucking black guy in the background. <laughs> Holy fucking shit. Big up you, whoever you are, guy. Big up you. Collect your money. But fuck, I didn't realize it was even there at first. I was like, what the fuck is that? I was like, oh shit. That's a person back there. Anyway, um, yeah. So Theo Vaughn and, and Brendan started off that show because Theo would always take the piss out of Brendan. And people liked that bit of humor and fun that they had on the show and actually that was only that was one of the times where people actually were fans of brendan because he didn't take himself too seriously and was able to have you know someone joke at him and stuff and poke fun at him and whatnot and then you know that led into the king of the sting but another time you know Theo saw that brendan was bad for business left and then brendan got Chris Lear and Griffin involved because they were both down bad and needed jobs. ...be poorly executed and require changes on the fly. While he made a wise decision in not putting all of his eggs in the same basket as Callan, since in 2020, Callan was accused of sexual misconduct by four women, Brendan wasn't wise enough to foresee Chris D'Elia also being the subject of scrutiny in regards to his alleged sexual harassment of minors. Man, what the hell is it about being a stand-up comedian that makes you a freak? Eventually, Theo Vaughn was smart enough to notice that his participation in the podcast was more about having his name attached to the project than it being a platform for him to be creative, and he left it. In 2021, Brendan launched his Thick Boy brand and YouTube channel, which amassed a little more than paying a team to make him look like an established celebrity YouTuber, only for the channel to eventually devolve into a platform for all of Shab's already existent projects. Additionally, this channel, along with many other channels Brendan has control over, is known for deleting and censoring comments, particularly the ones that get traction. Despite this attempt at yet another pivot to being a solo online personality, Brendan Shab's 
success was entirely contingent on the people he somehow convinced to work with him. While the fighter and the kid's popularity had dwindled, the golden hour was still enjoying growth. But, like all things Schaub, it was immediately tainted by his inability to handle a spotlight. A couple of years prior, in 2019, Brendan and Theo, when they were the only members of the podcast, were answering questions sent in by listeners, and one of them was about if it was possible to be attractive while bald. Using about 5% of his magnanimous intellect, Brendan takes this as an opportunity to say that his longtime friend and spiritual stepfather, Joe Rogan, was, <laughs> and I quote, slinging dick. That ex spiritual stepfather, that's a fucking brutal thing to say. Isn't it? That, that is true. Though. Like I said, if ever there's a time where you can compare Brendan Schaub's fucking um, grief, watch how he reacts. God forbid it doesn't happen anytime soon, right? But watch how the difference in grief that Brendan will have if A, the time comes when his father passes away, or B, the time comes when Rogan passes away. Just watch the difference in grief online from Brendan. Just notice it. I bet you any money, Brendan's going to be sobbing on fucking camera. He might even go live on Instagram for the first time and actually cry about fucking Rogan in a way that he's never going to cry about his dad, which is fucking bizarre to say the least. Expression means one thing and one thing only, and given the context of the conversation, there was no way Shab meant something else with it. The problem. Let's see. What's, what's that say? Hold on. Let's see. What's that say? Only slinging some dick. The docu. The definition from Urban Dictionary to get your grind on, whether it be literally slinging dick to some, or whatever, or metaphorically slinging dick or performing activities. Yeah, so there's no other way to interpret it. And given the context of the conversation, there was no way Shab meant something else with it. The problem is, Joe Rogan has a wife, which meant Brendan was essentially revealing Joe was cheating on her, or at least claiming he was. Exactly. Later on, when the topic got brought up, he tried to claim that what he meant was that Joe was killing it in life, and you can <laughs> guess how well that excuse worked. That attempt at a save was so bad that, even though it had already been clipped, they actually cut that part out of the original episode, which only served to make things look even worse. Oh, really? I didn't know that little tidbit. I didn't know that that little clip that we all have seen of Brendan trying to explain why he said Brendan, Joe Rogan fucking slang's dick is not a bad thing. I didn't know that that got clipped from the original fucking show. They deleted it from the actual show itself. So you can't find it officially on any of Brendan Schaub's channels, but you obviously can find it other people. That's actually absolutely hilarious. He tried to apologize, fucked it up. Look, first of all, by talking too much, he exposed his friend. Then, by trying to fucking walk it back, he then fucked it up even more to the point where he had to delete it. Gotta love it. The topic of infidelity eventually came back with a vengeance, but directed at none other than Shab himself. At the beginning of 2022, on the 49th episode of the Trash Tuesday podcast, fellow comedian Andy Letterman began talking about a certain other comedian, whom she claimed sucked at comedy, who despite having a wife and kids, decided to suggestively invite her to walk him to his truck, an offer Annie rejected. As soon as the story was told, another of the show's hosts, Kalila Kuhn, immediately deduced who Annie was talking about and said that he had also tried to get with her was this also the moment where everyone started to hate kalila but did kalila and again i don't know anything about kalila's history will you guys in the chat to know more was kalila receiving that level of hate before this whole thing happened because this might have been an inflection point this is the point that they all exposed brendan but unfortunately for kalila this also was a point where the hate for her just went into fucking nuclear levels people then started to go in on her super hard started to rip apart her poems started to criticize her for liking to be fucked by random dudes all the time right like i don't know people just lo love to hate her so hard was that was that part of it or was she always hated i'm not really too sure because i feel like there was a point where people did like kalila a lot but then they didn't I'm not really too sure okay uh, ricky is saying no she was well hated before Okay, fair play. She was always a little sketch. <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> Kalila hate train keeps on rumbling. This is the first domino. Okay, this is the first domino. Eventually, they said that his initials were BS, which pretty much confirmed they were talking about Brendan. This became a big controversy when the always vigilant fighter in the kids subreddit capitalized on it immediately, picking it up and running, as well as turning it into a meme and making a variety of songs revolving yeah. around the phrase, Walg me to my trug. While the topic wasn't broached in his appearances to Joe Rogan or the Impulsive Podcast, when Schaub went on Andrew Schultz's Flagrant 2, he got grilled on it in a pretty masterful way. Despite asking Brendan about one of the most damning 
feeling and revealing things possible, Andrew remained aloof as if it wasn't some potentially life-destroying piece of information for Shab. Meanwhile, Shab handled it like you would expect, stuttering while trying to explain himself like a kid that got caught pissing in the sink, which, if you don't know, is also an actual ah. real habit of Brendan Shab and the entire Turkey Tom team. Underlining this situation was other corroborating factors unearthed by the Yo, this video, man. This video, I kind of feel bad for Brendan. This is must be the worst luck ever. Imagine being on a random live stream doing, I think at the time it was a, a Super Bowl um, watch along thing with some other illustrious guests like Mike Tyson and Donald fucking, what's his name? Um, what's his name? DC was there. Uh, you know, whatever, right? Great, great, great show. And then randomly, when you're off, sh when you're off stream, when it's just, a, you know, they're putting a little interim on there, a little kind of intermission thing going on there. They fucking have the fucking drones, have you doing a wide shot of just the entire mansion where you're all sitting in to make it, you know, to add to the ambiance. Then randomly, somebody picks up that they can see you walking across to some random girl in the crowd and giving them a fucking note. Do you know how horrible that is? Do you know how horrible that must have been? The bad luck that you have. On a random live stream, they pick, you could have been, he could have been anywhere. He could have been back there. You could have been over here. You could have been in the toilet. You could have been outside the front. Somehow, he happened to be just right here where the drones and the cameras were right in line and they picked him out. Super bad luck the subreddit, such as a video of Brendan Schaub passing a note to a woman, which was presumed to be his number. This clip was used in a video by a small YouTuber called Uniqueness, and not only were his videos about Brendan Schaub taken down with more false copyright claims, but Brendan actually went the distance and sued him. When trying to defend this insane and narcissistic decision, Brendan said, If you want to criticize my fight picks, my stand-up, my podcast, that's what I'm a public figure for. I signed up for that. That stuff does not bother me. But when you start slandering my name, stealing content, and creating this false narrative of cheating on my wife and do all this crazy sh and defamatory stuff and using my content and the clickbait stuff like that for years, well then you're not playing the same game, man. Then I have to do something. If you made your entire career off defamation, I have to do something. Several times I've had my team reach out and go, we don't want to pursue this, just stop. And he wouldn't. So what do you do? So this narrative and that, oh, this bigger YouTuber suing this other YouTuber for no reason to silence him. You know, I thought you didn't get down with cancel culture. I don't in any facet. This is different. It's different insofar as it affects him personally. Exactly. The allegations that Shab was a serial cheater were further substantiated by a series of screenshots exactly. from multiple different women, all shown being contacted or knowing someone who Shab contacted. Some of them even... Remembering the time that, uh, who? Brendan Schaub said in my DMs, wish that man wasn't married because I would have been on that. Oh, wow. Okay. Fair play. Been fresh out of high school. I think... Uh, wild accusation. I did take one, but Justin is my witness. We were FaceTiming when it happened. Shit. I think for something to be considered defamation, it would have to be false information. So I'm pretty sure that Unique was in the clear there. To help pay for the legal costs of dealing with Shab, Unique opened a GoFundMe page. Despite it failing to raise the amount of money set as the goal, Brendan lost the lawsuit anyway, along with a whopping $500,000. He also appears to have threatened to serve the Trash Tuesday crew with a lawsuit yeah. for daring to tell an anecdote of a guy cheating on his wife, which everyone immediately recognized must have been him without them even oh, having to oh. say his name. Through a series of of increasingly convoluted and schizophrenic Benadryl hallucinations, some courtesy of Brian Callen, no less, Brendan's beef with Trash Tuesday turned into Brendan being absolutely convinced that Kalila and Bobby Lee, her boyfriend, were running the Fighter and the Kids subreddit. In May 2022, Insane. Brendan and Brian called Kalila and Bobby to berate them for being responsible for all of the hate Brendan gets online, because there's no way he could have attracted all that hate himself, right? It must have been a conspiracy. During this call, Brendan claims to have 300 hundred pages of evidence that Bobby and Kalila were behind it all. Just two weeks later, he appeared on the- By the way, we've never seen those corroborating 300, 300 pages. And you know what the truth of it is? Brendan got hoodwinked. Brendan got scammed. That's what happened. Somebody very smart saw Brendan in a vulnerable moment and reached out to him and said, hey, I can find out who's at the, who's at the fucking, you know, who's at the, who's responsible for this fight in the kids subreddit? Who's the ones that are out there trolling you and putting smart on your name? This person lied to Brendan and said that they could do all these things for him, find out who it is. And essentially what they did is that they got, went on the Fire and the Kids subreddit, they clicked right, you know, what, they right clicked and then basically did view page source and printed it all out. All those HTML codes to make it seem like they did some work. And Brendan being a redact 
thought that that was evidence that it was Bobby Lee behind it. And most likely in that fucking HTML fucking, you know, uh, mass of fucking information, maybe, 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 maybe Bobby Lee's email address was in there. So I think what actually happened is that Brendan actually got scammed. That's what actually happened. I think he believes he had 300 pages because somebody reached out to him from like a cyber security team or something and fucking lied to him and he fucking bought it hood like hood like hook line and sinker. That's the actual sad thing about it. He got scammed. <laughs> That's fucking crazy. Tiger Belly podcast, which ran for an hour and 20 minutes, mostly consisting of Kalila and Brendan going back and forth unproductively, while Bobby just appeared to be shocked to be in this situation. In the episode of Trash Tuesday that came out to address this drama, Kalila specified that the only evidence ever provided to her and Bobby by Shab was a zoomed-in screenshot of HTML code that had the Tiger Belly email randomly exactly. put in the middle of the code. Now, I wish I could explain to you what that means or why that convinced Brendan, but for once, there's no plausible explanation as to what <laughs> happened. I don't no. It could have been that Brandon was looking for a justification to attack Kalila for exposing him on Trash Tuesday since he couldn't just do it straightforwardly, as it would have been an implied admission of the Trug Wog incident. My theory is this. My theory is this. My theory is that because the story goes that Bobby Lee's Yeah, the story the story goes that Bobby Lee's brother, um, the other guy, Stevie Weeby, right? They're both like they're both like fucking um what do you think called arrested development kids right they're both a little bit on the spectrum they're both kind of really old but they act like children but the story goes that bobby lee's brother at the time was um a bit of a guest star on the king and his thing he'd come in and be like some guest stuff whatever and essentially he was like a punching bag for them right they kind of bully him on that show because he's, he's a bit of a dweeb and he kind of let them do it to him the story goes that he's the one that told brendan about kalila's um bedroom kinks that she might be into fucking threesomes that she likes to be in open relationships and stuff whatever it may be i think she's the he's the one that's the story goes i think he's the one that told brendan for some reason you know like i don't know if you guys hear this or you've seen it before this is something that's very very niche but sometimes i've known guys who if they hear about another girl being a slag or being very fucking loose with how they fucking interact with sex and shit, it somehow gives them the right or the opportunity to try. Like when they hear that, it's like what it's like a it's like a fucking invitation, like a siren. So I think with Brendan, when Brendan heard that from Stevie that Kalila likes to get a bit freaky in the bedroom, it kind of immediately perked it piqued his interest. And what he did is that I'm pretty sure he then emailed her or DM'd her that same t after that same time that he heard that from Stevie. That's what basically happened. So when Kalila tried to expose him he probably felt like she didn't have a right to because in Brendan's head Kalila's a slag she's a bit of a whore she's a slut whatever because she likes to have sex with other, other dudes and I think that's what kind of got him upset to try and find that information about the 300 pages it's a bit of a strange thing to say and it sounds a bit convoluted it doesn't really make sense but I think that's where Brendan's head was because I always try and think of it in that redacted way of that he tries to think about things and i generally think in brendan's head he feels like he's justified in everything that he does so what better way to be justified than saying hey you know this person is a fucking slag anyway how dare you try and expose me when you're a fucking slag in the first place and then he got angry about it. That's, that's my thinking. And it could have also been that he wanted to go with the subreddit and needed a pretext besides that the posts on it were hurting his fee fees. In either case, though, would he be downright stupid enough to just put their emails into the subreddit's inspect element, screenshot it, and save that as evidence? As we've come to learn, Brendan is a moron, but is he yeah. that much of a mouth breather? If he is that stupid, would he know how to do inspect element? Did he get help from someone? There are a lot of unanswerable questions here. The bottom line was that when he became the target of substantiated accusations of wrongdoing, Brendan decided to make a bunch of unsubstantiated accusations about someone else. It really didn't help it that it was Bobby Lee, who is a comedian and is also well liked by other comedians with a loyal following. Meaning Brendan wasn't just making himself look dumb to random strangers, he was burning bridges in the business that he supposedly cared about. One of the more impactful signs that Brendan's credit with the comedy world was drying up fast was that it seemed that Joe Rogan was becoming more comfortable with putting him in a negative light. During a discussion on his podcast, the topic of Brendan Schaub's conspiracy theory about the UFC purposely having one of their fighters not make weight so that they could change the card was brought up. And Joe said that it was ridiculous and evidence that Shab needed a handler to keep him from saying absurd things. A pretty common Rogan W. In response, Shab essentially went, no you, while visibly so upset he was almost crying. I don't need a handler. 
these guys need a handler. All this controversy is underlined by Schaub's second comedy special, The Gringo Poppy, which somehow managed to outdo his predecessor and underperform even further, getting a mesmer- Oh, you see? Officially, I didn't know that. So even IMBD agrees with me. IMBD says that You'd Be Surprised got a 1.5 and Gringo Poppy got a 1.1. So IMBD agrees with me. You'd Be Surprised is a better comedy special than Gringo Poppy. I'm happy about that. Pat myself on the back. <laughs> Memorizing 1.1 rating on IMDb. Much like his previous special, the poor reception was quickly followed by a string of false copyright takedowns. Not only were many comedians turning on him, but the MMA world was beginning to turn its back on Brendan as well. Ariel Helwani and Dana White, just to name a couple, had already noticed how Shab's relationship with fighters and MMA culture was parasitic. With his career, I love how he pronounces Ariel. Ariel, is that how you pronounce it? Is that Ariel? Ariel Hawani. Career in comedy crashing and burning, and his reputation becoming disfigured beyond the hope of repair, he couldn't even sell tickets anymore, and consequently, his streams of income were shutting down. Because of this, Brendan ended up firing Mark Harley from his crew, and Harley promptly exposed Brendan for a myriad of things in a Reddit AMA. Among the many things he addressed in the post, Mark claimed that Shaw was indeed a pathological liar who chronically overplayed the size of his social media presence, going as far as viewbotting a special on YouTube to the tune of hundreds of thousands, as well as buying followers followers on Twitter and Instagram. Mark also gave significant backing to Shab's cheating. Since he was the person responsible for managing is baddie named Chloe. It was in my hidden messages. Same with young baddie, 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 bad, 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 baddie party, baddie party, bad, 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 baddie party, baddie party, bad, 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 adding to baddies, adding to baddies, bad, 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 adding to baddies, adding to baddies, bad, 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 A and B, A and B, adding to baddies, adding to baddies, adding to baddies. <laughs> managing Shab socials, he got annoyed at how often Shab basically asked him if there were any baddies hitting him up in the DMs, and even provided receipts for it. As much as it sucks that this horror show will continue to go on indefinitely, since none of Shab's offenses are sufficient enough to have him go away, I have to say, there's so much unintentional humor that's just oozing from this whole phenomenon, it's actually impressive. Yeah, it's fun. Season 1, we went to Asia forever, and then Season 2, we went to Europe, Africa, and, uh... Damn, you went to Africa? Well, just for one location. God damn it, what was I gonna say? We were in, uh... Morocco. Jesus Christ, dude. Uh, people say Africa like it's a country. I do it too all the time. Africa is a country. That's a big continent. <laughs> continent though, yeah. But moving on, <laughs> depending on how much of a zoomer you are, it's quite likely you've never heard of Dane Cook. Uh, but if you're a anyway, anyway, that was a fucking amazing little video there from fucking Turkey Tom.